<clears throat> Good morning to each and every one of you. I want to look at a lesson today on a sanctuary. Now, a lot of times people will equate a sanctuary with a place where everyone comes and assembles to worship. But you know where else there should be a sanctuary? In your home. That should be a place of safety for a level of morality that the world, the things they're practicing, should not be in your home. Your home should be a safe place for you to take ease and rest for your family, for all those that come round about. And here's a standard for you. Within your home, if Christ were to come knock on your door and say, may I enter in, would you be thankful He was there or ashamed of the things that are in there? That's a standard that we must live by, that if He comes knock on our door, that we're thrilled that He's there and we don't have to put up anything. Everything there, we don't have to worry about what He sees. Everything there is as it should be. I'm going to read for you in Exodus chapter 12, verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Now what this is talking about, this is talking about the lamb that's going to be slaughtered in, the, in Exodus in the land of Egypt where all the firstborn is going, to be, is going to be killed because they would not let God's people go and the Lord's telling them what they need to do, that they must put sprinkled blood from this lamb on the doorpost, on the top, on the side, on each side to protect them and everybody that's in that house. Everybody that's in that dwelling. And you probably know what I'm getting at when I'm talking about this. Everybody in that household. Well, that is exactly what it should be like for a Christian household. It should be a safe place. Safe place morally. And I don't mean like what people talk about today in a safe space. I mean a safe place morally where people come in, they don't have to worry about the things of this world. That place is a safe place morally so that the, you won't have to deal with those things of this world. I'm going to read on down a little bit more in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses wherein ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. What kind of plague was going to affect them? Well, the firstborn was going to die. But everybody in that household was covered while they stayed in that household, they were covered. That blood was covering them, just like Christians today. That blood was covering them. That death that's going to overtake at least the firstborn of everything in that country is not going to affect them. They are going to be covered. They are covered in that blood. I'm going to go over and look in Revelations chapter 7 also where it talks about a sanctification or a covering or a mark that's going to keep them, all those that are servants of God in Revelation chapter 7, verse 2 beginning. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God and... And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. In other words, these, these individuals will not be hurt. They will not be hurt. Just like in Exodus, the blood on that door, on those doorposts, which makes a covering and covers that entire door, which is the entrance into that dwelling, they were covered. They were not to be touched. Now, I want you to think about something. In your household, your home, your place of dwelling, a place that when you walk into, you should be able to... You're out of the world. You're not dealing with all the things of this world. You're in your household. You should be able to rest. I've heard many times that people talked about how the preachers before me in my grandparents' day and time, they would warn people about the televisions. I'll warn you about that today, about the televisions. See, you have a doorway and you say, I don't want anything to pass through this doorway that's evil in this world. What about a portal that's in your household that if it's playing the wrong things, it will affect your mind, all those people around about you? You have to be concerned about that. Now, even more so... Just what I'm using this morning to record with, I have to be careful of that device right there. That device I carry it with me all the time. 
a lot of times. You know, when I'm at home, when I'm outside, a lot of times I don't have it with me, but when I'm around about business, when I'm working in various places, I have that with me in my home. It's not too far from me. It's in my home. I have to be careful of that. I myself have to be careful of that because what plays on that, I'm going to see it and it's going to be something going to go within my mind and I don't want anything evil to be there because it can affect me just like everyone else. So even more so, as I said, the preachers that came before me generations ago, the people that were preaching against that, the things which can be on the televisions, they were warning people then, so do I now. Televisions, cell phones, tablets, we have to be careful because that doorway, it's not just the physical doorway we have to be concerned with, it's every other thing in our house that can bring in the world to those people. And imagine, think about this. Just as I was saying, you don't want to have anything in your house. You want to have that standard that if Christ comes knocking on your door, you are a thrill that He's there and not ashamed of the things within the house. What about what you're playing on the TV and the cell phones? If He comes knocks on the door, can I come in? Would you say, oh, just a second, I've got to turn this off. Well, we shouldn't, it's something we shouldn't be watching to begin with. We shouldn't have it on there. So we have to be careful of that. And it can creep in. It can be something simple that can creep into our lives. It can be something that didn't, ha didn't seem that bad at first. Maybe something that you're watching. Maybe the producers decide to start putting little things in the show. Turn it off, it's not worth watching. Turn it off, don't watch it. Because those little things can add up to some serious problems for us if we don't watch that. But in Hebrews chapter 10 is where I turn to. I'm going to read verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our, blood, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. So again, going back to the heart, and if we're watching with a heart, we're seeing with a pure conscience toward God, we see those things and they should appall us. Those things that are evil and vile in this world, they should appall us. It should cause us to recoil, but a lot of times our heart, even without realizing it, has been hardened to the fact of sin that's on TV, on our cell phones, on the things happening in this world. Our heart's been hardened toward that, so the things that we would have recoiled from in days past, now we embrace it because it doesn't bother us anymore. We have to be careful of that. And again, our home should be a sanctuary. In Hebrews chapter 11, Starting in verse 27, For by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. That's talking about exactly what we were looking at just a second ago in Exodus and those children of God, those people that were servants to God, and were not going to have to endure the killing, the the uh, firstborn that was going to be killed because of the sake of Egypt, because of not allowing their people to go. And again, verse 27, for he forsook Egypt. You know what Egypt is to us today? The world. That's what that is. Not willing to endure the pleasures of this world. That's exactly how it translates to us. Not wanting to touch those things. Through faith he kept the Passover. We'll go down and read a little more in verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. By faith, by faith, by faith, all through there, by faith, by faith. Pay attention to what God's Word said. By faith, obeyed it. Notice what God said. Did not want to touch those evil things. Wanted to follow what God says by faith. Now I'm going to go over First 1 John. Chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Again, what they dealt with in Egypt is exactly what we deal with today when we are desiring to go back into Egypt after the children of God left that place and wanting to go back into that place, almost all of them wanting to go back. That's exactly like us today if we are deciding to want to go back into the world. And it doesn't have to be, and it can be a very deceiving thing, it doesn't have to be that I decide that I'm not going to do everything that I should be doing for God. It could be as simple as I turn on my cell phone and I go to a site that I should not be visiting. It could be that. That's where it could start. 
And it would seem like a thing that, well, nobody's going to see what's going on. God sees it. He knows from the heart. Our heart, when our heart is right before God, then our hands are going to work for Him. Our speech is going to sound like it should for Him. Our actions are going to be in line for Him. And everything else is going to work as it should, as we should act for Him. It's not just what other people see, of course. It's what God sees. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 7. Verse 24. Wherefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. From the heart, obeying what God says, He will liken us unto a wise man, it says here, which built his house upon a rock. The foundation within even our household, when we look at it, that foundation is built upon a rock. So when storms come, when Satan comes to try to tempt us and tries to pull us out, we have that foundation. If we in our homes do not have that which is according to God's will, and we have things in our home that we ought not. We have evil things. We might have things and we might have images that we shouldn't have in our house. Well, it's not going to work. I can tell you that Satan is right there in your house. We go home again, we want to be able to relax. If we are not from a foundational standpoint, and the family is a foundation, if we're not doing what God says in our own house, then how in the world can we do what's right? out in the world. We have a weak foundation if we do that. We can't do that. We have to have a strong foundation. From the beginning, Satan hates a family unit. He hates and despises family units. He hates them because God has established them. He knows that through a strong foundation, through a strong family, that nations can go forward, that populations can grow, that people can be helped in the way they should, that families will lead lives according to God's will. If you have a strong foundation and you have a husband and a wife that's willing to obey the exact actions that God has said, that is a strong foundation. That is a very strong foundation that he, Satan, despises. I'm going to go over to 1 Peter. In chapter 2, beginning, in chapter 2, rather than verse 9, beginning. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, hood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A peculiar people, a different people, people that are set apart, people that act different, people that look different, people's homes within their homes, they're different. We don't play around with Satan. We don't play around with evil things. There's all kinds of jewelry, art, these satanic things that people will have. We don't play around with those things. We don't touch those things. We don't have those things around. There's people that will have games. And I'll mention this one specifically because people look at it like it's a harmless thing and it can be a very detrimental thing. It's Ouija boards. Don't have those. People will use those. People will say, well, that's nothing. People will really try to use those to communicate with the dead. And you can go back early in the Scriptures and see where God said, don't do that. You're just inviting Satan in with these little things. These little things we ought not to even touch. We need to burn those things. Something might look innocent because they call it a game. They're not. Satan will use these little things that people think that are innocent to get a foothold because someone will say, well, I was able to communicate with my long lost, plug in the name. What else are you going to do in order to try to get communication with someone that you want to talk to? Would you allow a satanic ritual there? Some people do. Some people do. Not in our households. It's a safe place for us. It's a safe place that we don't touch those evil, evil, evil things. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 16, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Seems simple. We follow what God's Word says. 
in our homes, where we're at, we take that. Now, a lot of times people don't realize this, but what you do in your homes, you take out with you. You take out with you for other people to see. Whether that's a piece of jewelry, or whether that's the way we dress, especially how we speak and interact, the things that we're watching on TV. And I'll give you an example. How frequently have you went to your place where you work and you've talked about the date the next day about what you watched the night before? That happens all the time. I hear it all the time where I work at. That's a constant thing. People talk about what they watch, whether at some kind of game, whether there's some kind of television show or some kind of game show. No matter what it is, they talk about it. Why? Because what you watch, you let filter in, it's going to come back out of your mouth. So we have to be careful of that. What we have in our households, what we have around about us, we have to be very careful of that. I'm, on, I'm in Titus, where I was flipping to as I was talking. In Titus chapter 2, in verse 14, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. A people that are willing and zealous. Zealous is someone that is really wanting to do good things. That's really, really wanting to do good things. It's not somebody that's fly by the night. It's not somebody that's haphazard. It's someone who really tries. Has that zeal. You know, Saul, before he was Paul, he had a zeal. Oh, he had a zeal. He was zealous. He went out and he thought what he was doing was right. And he was really, really going out and trying to destroy the, the congregations. He was zealous. Didn't mean what he was doing was right, and we know it wasn't right, and he repented, and he turned from that, but he was zealous of that. In Matthew chapter 26, in verse 27, And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the, that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. A lot of things that we look at, that we can look at in the what we refer to as the Old Testament, the Scriptures before, we, before the New Testament, we can see that it was a foreshadowing of things that happened in the New Testament. The blood of the Lamb being sprinkled on the doorpost how we can look at how that when Christ's blood was spilled to sanctify us, that we have that covering that that death will not hold us, will not keep us down, will not keep us in the grave, will not keep us there, just as the death passed through Egypt did not affect all the firstborn, just as the blood of Christ, when it's applied to us, that death we know has no hold on us, had no hold on them. They had to fear. They didn't have to fear death. When those Israelites, when those people that were there, when the they woke up the next morning, now I don't know, I don't know in that land, all those people that were there, all those people, how every individual felt in that land, but when the next day when they woke up, when they got up, and everyone there and they heard the cries, all the children of Israel heard the cries of all the Egyptians, well they seen God's hand at work. They seen what a serious situation it is, and they knew how serious it was, and that they were being held there. But they seen God at work, just like now that we're going to see. We see His hand at work right now. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We see God's hand at work right now, but we're going to see. Everyone will see a work like they've never seen before. Eventually, this whole world is going to see a work like they've never seen before. At the end. They're going to, there's going to be crying and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be wailing because they didn't obey what God says. They didn't have that blood covering them. They weren't taking the time to see what God's Word says. They didn't take a warning. In Psalms chapter 91, in verse 9, it says this, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in thy ways. Verse 12, They shall bear thee up in thy, their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, Satan tried to misuse those verses. We know from the Scriptures he tried to misuse those. But notice in verse 10 it says, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh 
thy dwelling. If we follow what God's Word says, we will keep out sin out of our households. If we follow what God's Word says, we'll keep it out. We'll keep it out of our house. We'll have children that follow what God's Word says. We'll have neighbors that when they see us, they'll see a difference in us because we, they don't see us taking things in our homes. And you better believe that as Christians that people watch that. They watch what you take in your house. They watch what comes out of your house. They watch how you interact with people around about you. They see how you, what you have on your televisions, through your windows. They see what's on. And if they see some kind of smut on your TV, and they say, well, they're watching the same things I'm watching. We can't be like that. We can't be like that. We keep those evil things out away from us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Temple of God. Why? The Holy Ghost dwells within us. We have to watch that. We have to watch that and make sure that we're not defiling it. See, we think a lot of times about sin and how Satan will try to defile the temple, that he would try to come in, that he would try to defile it. That people were there, we can read in the New Testament how that people were there within the temple that had an evil spirit. He would try to sneak in, in other words. He would try to come in. He would try to come in the temple and try to cause problems. Just like with us, he will try to sneak things in again, I don't mean to keep saying TVs, but something that keeps coming to my mind thinking about this. TVs or cell phones, he'll try to sneak stuff in. He'll try to send stuff to you. He'll try to cause you to fall by temptation. But in Romans chapter 12, that's where I'm going to turn to. In verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Now, is it a great thing when we do that? Which is your reasonable service. It is a reasonable service. It is a necessary thing for us to do. It is not something and in this world, because this world is so dark, when someone is doing what is according to God's will, it is something someone looks at and admires, and it is a good thing. It is a wonderful thing to see, but it is a reasonable service. We should feel like that we're doing what we should be doing when we are not partaking of the things of this world, we're just, it's a reasonable service that we're not allowing evils to come into our mind. It's a reasonable service. It's reasonable for us to do that. In 1 Thessalonians, that's where I'm going to turn to. Chapter 5, verse 22. This verse is something I read many times, and when I finally understood it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Well, that takes in a lot, doesn't it? That takes in a lot of things. Because some things that we think are okay gives off the appearance of evil. We better not touch it. We don't even want people to think that we have anything to do with evil. Not at all. Abstain from all appearance of evil. All those things. If there's something, if there's something, and I'll warn you about this, if there's something that you are not sure about, don't touch it. Don't. You're better off to wait and pray and look at the Scriptures and see what it says. I heard someone say this before and I thought this was so fitting. They were talking about how that Satan owns the fence. Yeah, that's very true. People say, well, I'm trying to ride the fence. No, what you're doing is stepping out of God's grace and onto evilness. There is no riding the fence. There is no riding the fence. When you're on the fence, you're playing in Satan's playground. You're playing in his playground. You're not playing in God's playground. When someone thinks they're straddling the fence and are kind of over here and kind of over there, no, they're all the way over there. They've stepped into sin. There is no halfway with God. Again, equating back to our household, there is no halfway with God. If there's something in your household that is not upright before God, burn it. Burn it. Get rid of it. Throw it away. 
As I, the longer I was a Christian, the more I grew. There's certain things in my life, certain things I listened to, certain music that I listened to, certain things that I'd watch in my life, certain movies that I thought were okay when I was out in the world that I can't have anything to do with now. Get rid of it. It's worthless. You leave this life, it won't mean anything to you anymore. So imagine if you leave this life tomorrow. Would you want that in your household for someone else to take? Not if it's not right before God. Better off get rid of it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor. For ye, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Too often that happens in this world where people are mad and they go to bed mad. They wake up mad. They stay mad for weeks at a time. Sometimes with somebody you're better off. As the Scripture says, don't, let your, don't go to sleep. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Make things right. Make things right before God. Again, Satan hates a unified front. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, rife, strife, sedition, stra- seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of the which I tell you before as I have also told you in times past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Satan will try to put a division between you and your spouse. He tries several ways to put a a division between you and your spouse. Again, he hates a unified household in faith. In Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to read verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Satan tries to put a division. I'm not going to be able to go over all the things that would cause a division in a household and a marriage, but I'm going to touch on just a little bit. He tries to put a division between you because of the fact that maybe you're mad at each other about something. He tries to cause division. Now that's the first thing that he'll do when he does that, then he'll try to bring other things in. That's what happens in households. A lot of times you hear about this in co-worker environment where a husband or a wife is working somewhere and all of a sudden they go to someone they're working with and they talk about all their problems with someone of the opposite at six, and that person's all too glad to talk to them. Now again, that person talking to them, maybe they don't realize, maybe it wasn't their intent to cause a division between the husband and the wife, whatever situation it may be when someone goes into work, they're telling all their problems to that person, and they're a shoulder to cry on. Satan is going to try to use that as a temptation to draw you away from your spouse because suddenly, instead of being close to your spouse, instead of being someone you can confide in, instead of them being your best friend, instead of them being someone that God has blessed you with to be there to hear your problems, to work out those problems, to be a unified front through a unified front to fighting in Satan, suddenly someone else is who you're turning to. It happens slowly, but it happens. It happens. And that's just one way that he tries to bring in that division so that you, are, you do not have a place to come to a rest, you do not have a place to come to, and that you are unified through prayer, through faith, through coming together and serving God faithfully. Your husband and your wife, your spouse, that's your best friend. That's your best friend. That's somebody you can confide in. When you can tell nobody what else is going on in your life, you can tell your spouse. You can lean on them. You can come to them. They should be very close, very close to you. Satan tries to cause a division, so they're not. He tries to cause a division through lust. He tries to cause divisions in our homes. In 2 Corinthians is where I'm turning to right now. And in our home, fight for your home. I want to say that I'm, I'm getting close to the end of this lesson this morning. Fight for your home. Don't let things come into your home that cause division. If it causes a division, even if it's something you don't think is necessarily a bad thing right then, cast it out. Whatever it is. If it's somebody, if it's something, whatever it is, protect your homes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for with what for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with dark, showing us that those things that are contrary to one another can cause problems. If we have something in our home 
If we have something in our home that causes a division between our, a husband and wife, throw it out. It has no place there. It has no place in your home. In verse in First Corinthians, I'm gonna turn over and read in verse in chapter fifteen, rather, it's verse thirty three. Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. If I had a friend that caused problems with me and my wife, maybe it's a male friend, maybe he's saying something about her, I'm better off not talk to him anymore if it caused a division between me and my spouse. I'm better off not to have anything to do with him. Why? Because our home should be a sanctuary. Our home should be a place we go to. Our spouse should be our best friend. We should have union in our households. Just as we, as I talked about before, we don't want divisions in the church. Well, if our spouse, in several ways we can talk about this, but our spouse, if they're a Christian, they're a part of the church as well too, as you would know. And when we go home and we're with them, we don't want to cause divisions there either. We don't want to have divisions there. We don't want to have divisions in our families because in a broken household, there's all kinds of things that Satan will try to do and try to sneak in will try to cause us problems with. And I want to give you an example. It happened in the first family. In Genesis chapter 3, you know where I'm turning to right now with Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, who did Satan go to? Who did he go to? In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You know who he went to? Adam's helper. He went to his he Satan went to Adam's helper. Went and tried to undercut his foundation. This world tries to do that with us. Tries to undercut our foundation. I've said this before. How much can your spouse influence you? A lot. A whole lot. They're your best friend. They're there with you all the time. They're there to talk to you all the time. They're there to, more importantly, pray with you all the time. They're there to help you, and Satan wants to disrupt that. He knows if he can disrupt that. He knows if he can destroy the cohesiveness of a family that he's got you. He can destroy all kinds of things in your life. He can take people out. There's so many people in this world that you've heard of that are, and you see them in positions of authority, and they fall because they let that division come into their household. They let that division take root for various reasons, whether it was lust or power or money or whatever it may be. We had to protect our household. Now Ephesians chapter 5 is where I'm going to turn to and read this. There's a couple more verses I want to look at this morning. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. And there's a certain order that we must follow. In verse 22 beginning, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the Husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the savior, savior of the body. Wherefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. If something comes into my household, or tries to come into my household, tries to divide my wife, and myself, tries to cause problems with my child, you know what should happen? If they're here, I should be right here. I should be in the doorway. I should be a guard against that. But if we're not looking to watch all the things around about us, something might try to sneak in, so I have to watch that. That there's no division between my wife and my family in any way so that it doesn't sneak in. So that husbands, we are, we're supposed to be at the forefront Whatever may try to come in and bother our family, that we guard against it, we fight against it. You know, there's a lot of things in this world that's worth fighting for. There's a lot of things that are important. Number one, in our families, we keep out all evilness. And we fight for those families more than we fight for the things of this world. There may be, there may be things you want to fight for in this world. The family is what's important. We serve God first. And we put our families in high regard and we make sure that nothing comes in to separate us. Nothing comes in to cause division. I'm going to go over to Exodus chapter 12 for this last verse I want to read you this morning.
verse 22. And you shall take a branch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the in- lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Let us make sure again that our household is a sanctuary. That our household is covered in the blood. It's covered in the blood of Christ. That we do not let anything enter in that ought not be there. And that we protect our family like their eternity is at stake. Because it is. And for anyone that's not a Christian, I want to read these verses for you. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says this, So the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Luke thirteen three. I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. In Romans 10.10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Mark 16.16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That blood sacrifice, that blood sacrifice that allows us to have that covering, that allows us to have that protection that we must all have and we must all need to turn to. Thank you for your time as we come together and sing this selected song.